Okay, thank you, Dr. Wilde, for the introduction. Uh, so good morning, my name is Eliza, and today I will be discussing my work on quantifying the performance of bidirectional quantum teleportation. So, oh no, right. So first, some um, introductory remarks. I want everyone to sit down and recall normal quantum teleportation. Why did we need it? So our plan was to be able to transmit quantum information between two parties, Alice and Bob, directly through a wire, like we do classical information, right? However, we quickly figured out that it was, it was very difficult to do, right? Because quantum bits are very fragile, they could knock inside the wire and easily decohere or get absorbed into the wire or they come out so corrupted from the other end that it's just not worth it. So quantum physicists long ago came up with a way around this issue known as quantum teleportation. So just to put it, the protocol in the forefront of everyone's minds, I'm gonna go through it. So Alice and Bart, <laughs> two parties, Alice and Bob, they share an entangled pair of particles which I'm gonna denote as beta, and then they go their separate ways. Now, Alice, if she wanted to transmit a quantum state to Bob, what she would do is she would perform a measurement on the quantum state she's trying to transmit and her half of the entangled pair. And she would get two classical outcomes out of that, each of which she can have state zero or one. And then she sends those to Bob. Now, Bob, based on bits would perform local operations on his half of the entangled pair of particles and recover the original quantum state that Alice was trying to set him all along. Now, this is great. This got around the whole direct transmission issue that we are running into. But keep in mind, this is just a one-way communication channel between Alice and Bob. What if we also wanted Bob to be able to transmit information to Alice? So a more general description would be bidirectional quantum teleportation, which is just an extension of normal QT, but we wanna look at it because obviously, for example, if you're on the phone, you want both parties to be able to listen and respond. And this is actually going to be a key tool for something called quantum networking, where you have several quantum computers that wanna communicate with one another and quantum key distribution. So audience, this question's for you. What is the most simple way that you can think of to perform this quantum communication protocol? Feel free to unmute. Uh, just do two copies of the single direction protocol in opposite directions. Yeah, exactly. So just normal teleportation twice, right? So Alice transmits quantum information to Bob using a pair of entangled qubits. And then Bob also transmits quantum information to Alice using a pair of entangled qubits. And boom, you have BQT. And keep in mind, this is just the ideal version of bidirectional quantum teleportation. We're assuming that we have two pairs of perfectly entangled qubits. And so we will call this operation the swap operation because it's a perfect swap of information between Alice and Bob. Now, this is great, but it's very difficult to implement. Why? Because in the lab, entanglement itself is very hard to create. Most of the time, it just doesn't happen. And when it does happen, sometimes it's not even perfectly entangled. So it's not easy to do this in real life. And for this protocol, we need two pairs of entangled quantum bits. So, you know, it's, it's not easy. So what now? We want to find a protocol that can perform bidirectional quantum teleportation using an imperfect quantum resource state. Why imperfect? Again, we're doing things in the lab, so everything is going to be imperfect to some degree. And we want to look at all possible local operation and classical communication channels and optimize over all of them to find the best possible communication channel that we can put in this LOCC box that can perform bidirectional quantum teleportation using 
an imperfect quantum resource state as closely as possible. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the error between our procedure that we come up with and the ideal case. So this whole problem can be modeled as a computer program, actually. And we actually did model this. However, we quickly realized that optimizing over all LOCC channels is very tough. So we decided to use a little trick. We noticed that LOCC is just a subset of this larger set of completely positive and positive partial trust post-preserving channels, which are easier to optimize over and they're easier to describe mathematically. So since LOCC is contained in this larger set, we decided to expand the set that we're optimizing over into PPT. So, so this is our problem. We're trying to find the most optimal protocol to be able to transmit quantum information between two individuals bidirectionally given an imperfect quantum resource state. So does anyone have any questions up to now so far? Yes, yes, I have a question. What is a partially uh, transpose preserving map? So this is just a regular quantum channel. You can think of it, but parse, like a positive partial transpose is just an operation. So it's just a normal quantum channel that when you take like the, par the partial transpose of a state, it preserves it even if you take it through this channel. Basically, it's just, okay. it's just a and yeah. It doesn't matter that the, the transpose is itself not completely positive? No. So it's an interesting point that you raise. The CPPTP channels, what they do, if you've heard of PPT states, they preserve them like Elisa was saying. And the requirement, the mathematical requirement that they should obey, I think Elisa might have a later slide about it, is that you first take the transpose of the input, then you apply the bipartite channel, then you take the transpose again of the output. And <clears throat> oddly as it may seem, that is actually, um, um, sorry, the requirement is that that map is completely positive, which is not true for all maps, but for this class, it's made to be a requirement. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, so this is our goal, and we want to create a computer program that can help us solve this problem. So for that, we're gonna need some tools. So the first tool I'm gonna go over is convex optimization. If you don't know what that is, no problem. Just sit down and recall your early high school days or early college days when you were in calculus one. You were probably optimizing a function defined on a real line, and your optimization variables were these quantities or numbers, and you had some constraints. For example, if you were trying to minimize the cost of producing a soda can, AKA just the material of the soda can, you probably had some optimization variables like radius and height, and you have some constraints like your volume must be V. So you were trying to find the best radius and the best height to create this soda can while minimizing the cost, but your volume had to be V. So this is something similar. This is more general. You're still optimizing a function, but your optimization variables are now matrices, specifically positive semi-definite matrices, and you have some constraints. So notice your objective function is also linear and your constraints are also linear and they have some positive semi-definite constraints in them as well. And the next tool we have is the two error metrics that we use to quantify the performance between the ideal bidirectional quantum teleportation and the procedure that we came up with. So the first one we used was diamond distance. And you can think of that as just like the distance between the channels, how distinguishable the channels are from each other. So in this case, our channels are our procedure and ideal BQT, and we're trying to maximize that distance of all pure bipartite states. 
And the second error method you use was channel infidelity. So say you have two channels and you send the same quantum state through both of the channels. So, and then you look at whatever comes out of both of those channels and compare them. And that is something called the fidelity. So the error would obviously be one minus the fidelity, which is the infidelity. And you will see later on that due to the unique symmetries of the swap operation, which we said was ideal BQT, the optimization in both cases was the same. We were getting the same results. So in reality, we didn't really need both of these error metrics. We just needed one. This is just the general semi-definite program that we had come up with in the beginning. So you can see that this is the error over all PPT channels of the channel that we're trying to see, we're trying to study, and the resource state that we're using, imperfect quantum resource state. And we're trying to minimize the eigenvalues subject to these constraints. So the first constraint, the first two constraints just come from the semi-definite program for normalized diamond distance. You can see this is the Choi operator of the ideal bidirectional quantum teleportation, and this whole junk is just the Choi operator for our procedure. And the third constraint is just uh, for the PPT preserving operation or the PPT preserving requirement. And the last constraint is for the trace preserving requirement. So we took this program or this model and we made it into a MATLAB program or I made it into a MATLAB program, but I quickly realized that it wasn't, it wasn't good because it was taking up too much space and memory. And it actually at one point crashed my computer. So this is where we realized that we had to somehow simplify this problem. So this is where the symmetries of the swap channel came into play. So what do I mean by that? So if you had two parties, Alice and Bob, and they swapped their information beforehand, and then Alice performed a unitary U operation on her quantum bit, and Bob performed a unitary V operation on his quantum bit, it's the same thing as if Alice performed a unitary V operation on her quantum bit, and Bob performed a unitary O. Oh, U operation on his quantum bit, and then they swapped information. And due to these unique symmetries, you could simplify the problem. So I know this looks complicated, this new SDP, but you can just think of it as taking this very large matrix and we split it up into chunks, which is what you see in these K, L, M, and N. And also notice that the, the dimension of the swap is not really part of the matrices themselves. It's just a parameter now, this D. So that, so this program only relied on the dimension of the resource state itself, which is what made it easier to compute. So now we have some advantages. The new SDP is polynomial in complexity in the dimension of the resource state. It can be calculated you know, in MATLAB or in Python. And in some cases, we can also solve this by hand. Not that we would want to, we have the computers for that, but we could. <laughs> so now I'm gonna jump into some scenarios. Does anyone have any questions before I do this? Uh, I've, got, I've got one, I just wanted to be clear. So when you're looking at those symmetry conditions, what that does is it allows you to factor out all of Alice and Bob's local unitary operations that they would be doing and focus instead on just whatever subspace that would be actually doing the um, the resource state. Is that is that a accurate or fair or at least approximate understanding of what's going on? Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, yes, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so using the symmetry, as you said, it allows you to eliminate um, the, the Hilbert spaces on which the ideal swap is acting. And then the SDP becomes exclusively a function of the, the dimensions of the resource state, like Elisa said. 
So another thing to point out about the SDP, the simplified one, if you advance, um, these KLM, you can see there's constraints that they're positive semi-definite and they sum to identity. So you can think of them as a measurement on the resource state subject to all these funny partial transpose constraints that come about from the requirement that the overall simulation be a PPT preserving channel. Okay, please continue. Thanks, that, that's helpful. All right, so, so some scenarios that we considered. The first scenario that we considered was the no quantum resource state. This is where Alice and Bob have nothing. They have no quantum resource and they only have classical resources and they want to do quantum information. So how good is that compared to the swap channel or ideal BQT? So the best we could do, we realized, was one minus one over D squared, where D is just the dimension of the swap channel. And this is important because this established a worst case scenario or a bound. So any other BQT protocol that we come up with after this, it has to be better than this. Otherwise, it's just not worth it. And the second scenario that we looked at was the isotropic state. Why isotropic? So the isotropic state is unique such that it's partially pure and partially mixed. And how much is pure and how much is mixed, it depends on this parameter called fidelity. So as you can see in here, as the fidelity or the pureness of the isotropic state went up, the error between ideal BQT and our procedure went down. And in some cases, I don't have it here. In some cases, the error in LOP was equal to the error in PPT, or like error in optimizing over all PPT channels. So this was just the scenarios we looked at, you know, looking at some imperfect resource states. But we also decided to go in and take a look at another protocol that was formulated by Kiktenko et al. So in this protocol, they were using one entangled quantum state as their resource. And this is the first scenario they came up with. Alice and Bob basically have trigger qubits. And you can think of trigger qubits as just classical bits. They just have one of two states, zero or one. And depending on the state of the trigger qubit on each party's side, they would perform normal, regular quantum teleportation. For example, if Alice's trigger qubit was in state one, she would be performing quantum teleportation and sending information to Bob. And if Bob's trigger qubit was in state one, he would be, he would be performing teleportation and sending quantum information to Alice. And if trigger qubit was zero, then both parties or just a single party would not be doing anything. And the other protocol that they studied was just one trigger qubit dictating the actions of both parties and whether they're performing quantum teleportation. Mm -hmm. And so after analyzing both of these protocols, we realized that they just did not go above the classical threshold that we established earlier. So it wasn't, it wasn't a very, um, good for our case. It just didn't go above the classical threshold. So we decided to come up with or propose with an alternate protocol, which was provably optimal, error one minus one over D. So what do you do? The two parties must first prepare this specific quantum state. And how do they do that? They do that through something called the bilateral twirl. And in the bilateral twirl, it involves two parties. And it gives State. These symmetric properties, so if you think back to the symmetries of the swap, it also does this for these quantum states, such that if Alice were to perform a unitary U operation on the quantum state and Bob were to perform the, the conjugate of that operation, the quantum state would be invariant under that those specific set of operations. And why do we why do we need this? Because it reduces the parameters necessary to describe them. So you can think of this huge matrix and the parameters are the entries of that matrix. And a lot of those entries are just going to zero as a result of this bilateral twirl. So after they, they do the bilateral twirl, they prepare the state and then they separate out 
two edits from the state to perform BQT. Why two edits? Again, going back to ideal BQT, you need two pairs of entangled qubits or multi-dimensional multi quantum resource states. So they try to separate out two edits, two edits as best as possible. So this was my work, what we had done so far. But future work, of course, we would want to look at more parties. This was just a bi-directional case with Alice and Bob. What if we wanted to add a third party to the mix, Charlie? What procedure would they follow to communicate quantum information between the three of them? And also, over here, we were simulating the swap channel. In reality, you could try to simulate any other quantum channel out there following similar techniques and seeing what procedure and what constraints follow with simulating that channel. So any questions? Uh, thank you, Elisa, for your talk. That was very nice. Um, indeed, are there questions from the audience? There are some questions throughout. We do have a few minutes. You know, we scheduled this extra time in between. Um, actually, I had a question. So the state that we're preparing, could you, could you go back to that? Uh, right, the bilateral tool. Uh, uh, well, uh, can you explain what the first state is? Is that any pure state? Uh, phi d square of a hat b hat? I think like that is a maximally entangled state. Okay. Sorry, just to be clear, um, what you do is you start out with <clears throat> a lower dimensional maximum entangled state, phi d. And okay. the bi then you do a bilateral twirl on that. And then the state becomes the one depicted in the figure. Okay. So as an example, if they share an EBIT and they want to try to like produce from that an approximation of two EBITs, they can take the single EBIT uh, tensor in uh, qubits in the zero state, they each do that. Alice does a random two dimensional, sorry, uh, two qubit unitary, tells Bob which one she did, and then the state will become this mixture, right? And in this particular case, uh, it'll, it'll have fidelity one half with a perfect two EBIT state. Okay. So th this, the thing is that you, you start with just a single EBIT. So you're not going to be able to get like two EBITs from it because it's, you know, it's like a thermodynamic argument. You can't get something from nothing. So then you do this kind of approximation. And then, and then what we could prove is that this is an optimal procedure for bidirectional teleportation if all you have is a single EBIT. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there questions we could, you know, a minute or so? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so here, yeah, in this slide, you mentioned about um, doing this uh, tri-directional or multi-directional quantum teleportation. So what exactly would be the quantum channel that you're, you're trying to simulate in this case? That would be the permutation channel. So if you know how the permutation channel works, it's like three parties. Alice is trying to transmit information to Charlie, and then Charlie goes up to Bob, and Bob goes up to Alice. So that's the permutation channel that you would want to simulate. Yeah, I see. cyclic swap. Yeah. Right. Interesting. I mean, it's without loss of generality because the the, the names are just like labels, right? And so yeah. without, without loss of generality, it suffices to do a cyclic swap. Mm -hmm. and, and another question I had was um, for the no resource state case, um, could you instead think about putting a resource state that is simply not entangled or just separable? And would you get the same result in that case? Well, I mean, yeah, in order to perform you know, bi-directional quantum teleportation, you would need an entangled state. So it, it would make sense to just put something that's not entangled. And another thing I wanted to mention, I don't think I mentioned it, 
you, in some scenarios, you would also want to look at the trade-off between just using these imperfect quantum resource states and just using, you know, whatever entangled pairs of quantum bits that come out of the lab, because they're going to be imperfect, the two pairs, and then you have an imperfect quantum resource state. In what cases, it's just making the two entangled pairs of quantum bits better than the resource states. Right. And that's something that needs to be looked at as well and considered. Right. What, right. When, when is it better to just do two uh, teleportations, even with an imperfect state, um, as opposed to doing a more general protocol that you develop here? Right. I see. Mm -hmm. OK. I have one question. If you have an entangled, entangled state AB, you can only use it once for teleportation, is it not? Yes. Yes. Which is, um, which is why the ideal version requires two pairs. Am I understanding your question? Because my, my point is that whatever you talk by directional and so on, if you have one state, you can only use it in one, one way. If A sends something to B, that's it. So, so Ravi, it's an interesting question. Um, what we're saying is like something you can, you can consider is you have this one EBIT and then you can try to use that in some way to do teleportation twice. And so inevitably when you do this, you don't have enough resources. So there's gonna be an error. And we proved that, you know, the error will be one half according to this metric. And then we, we proved that's the best you could do among all possible protocols. And then we proposed the protocol that can do that. So, well, I think what I'm not understanding is that even perf forget all the imperfections and so on, even in a perfect situation, if I have an entangled state, it's destroyed at the moment you want to teleport something from A to B. Yeah, so what we're saying is before you do that, first do this bilateral twirl and like you kind of spread it out to two EBITs approximately with not a good fidelity, but with the best fidelity possible. And then you use that to do teleportation twice. So we hit 935, we should probably move on to our next speaker. Uh, thank you again, Elisa, for a nice talk. Okay. Um, so our next